Okay, here we are for Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, now before we start with Ephesians chapter 2, I wanted to quickly just read a verse to you that will kind of set this up. This is Jesus talking about his ministry in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3 verse 18 to 21. He that believes on him, Jesus, is not condemned, but he that does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Now, even when you do good, but, you, but if you deny God, even when you're doing good, technically that is evil, because you are denying credit to the author of all that is good. So you can't, you're stealing from God, saying, well, I'm good without God. That, that is uh, taking something from God, so that is... Uh, subject to condemnation. Okay. For everyone that does evil hates the light, and doesn't come to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, and they are wrought in God. Alright, so now, chapter 2. And you, he has quickened, quickened mean brought to life, right? You, he has sparked up. He has brought to life you who were dead in sin. He has brought you to life by giving you this faith in him and you, you believe him. So now you were dead in your sin. Now you are coming to life. There, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air. What's the power of the air? Well, <laughs> what, do you, what do we have today? We have the airwaves. They call the airwaves, right? You got television, radio, um, the internet, and there's a lot of uh, bad things or a lot of crap. It's, it's a lot of um, um, oppression, a lot of opposition, a lot of um, problems, you could say. A lot of uh, misunderstanding, misinformation, um, a lot of that stuff all comes through the airwaves, right? So the prince of the power of the air, what else comes out of the air? Bombs, bombs come out of the air. Uh, what's, when, 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 uh, that's what makes the United States the, the most powerful nation militarily, is what are they, the first thing they do. They gain, they gain air superiority so that the other enemy cannot fly anything in the air. So as soon as you got that, you you win. You've already won, right, for, for military. So the power of the air, right, and the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So those who, who do not know God through Christ, who do not know the truth, who do not have this connection of the inheritance through Christ. Um, um, people who are deceived, right? People who are, they're, they're drinking the Kool-Aid, following the wrong path. Uh, they're the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. Because they disobeyed because they did not believe Jesus. Jesus. God said, obey my son, listen to my son. And they disobeyed that. Okay, they say, we don't need to do that. We're, 
we can do things ourselves. And so that there's a spirit that works on them because they can be deceived because they don't have the wisdom, you see. It all works together, okay? So, among whom, so among whom, among the children of disobedience, right? We also had our conversation in times past, right? Uh, we, our interaction with other people and in our lives, we also were that in the past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So we were no better than others. We were by nature the children of disobedience, doing all these things that uh, God has forbidden. Um, so he's saying, don't forget, you know, you were like that yourself until God called you, right? Okay. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love that he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, he, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. So if you read the book of Galatians, that's a lot about that, the, the saving grace. So we were dead in sins, and he has made us alive with Christ. So it's not, you didn't do anything. He, just by believing, you were made alive in Christ. And he raised us from the dead together. And he made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So when you are in Christ, and you are a part of that body, and you are in his will, then you are with him. You are sitting in those heavenly places that he is in, in charge of all things and, and over all of creation. Okay? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. So in in coming times, he's telling the Christians, in times to come, God is able, he might show to the rest of the world his exceeding riches and, and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So you didn't do anything. You All you did was believe, right? And it's not works, lest any man should boast. So God has, con you, your connection to God is not by what you do. It's by what you believe. It's completely by what you believe. But what you do comes as a result of that. Right? So the first thing to do is get is to believe. It's like Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, and all these other things will be added to you. So for we are his workmanship, created in Christ unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so uh, now he's talking about what you do, that we should walk in them. So we are his workmanship. We are, uh, Christ has made us who we are. We are recreated because we are born, we are came alive out of our sin, as born again, right, in Jesus to do good works which God has already determined what those good works are. He has ordained already that we should walk in those things that God has ordained. 
Therefore, remember that before, in times past, you were Gentiles in the flesh, and you were called uncircumcision uh, by the, the Jewish religion, right? You were the uncircumcised. You were the uh, not sacred, the, just the world, uh, nothing special about you, okay? You were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision by the Jews right the Jewish uh, the Hebrew Bible the Jewish religion they are called the circumcision the set apart for God right so in in the past you were called uncircumcision by the circumcision okay by those who are called the circumcision made in the circumcision of the flesh made by hands so there's the key now the the the, the old the the hebrew uh circumcision is a is made by a man's hands and it's the circumcision of their flesh right where you were called uncircumcised by those who are circumcised right in the past at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel so they were holy because they were circumcised they were set apart for God and you were called uncircumcised okay and you were strangers and you were not a part of the covenant right strangers from the covenants you you had no promise and no hope and you were without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus you who were far off before are made near by the blood of Christ so you are no longer the uncircumcision the outsiders you are now an insider. You are now brought in by Christ. Okay? Because, before, because he is our peace, who has made both one, both the circumcision of the flesh and the uncircumcision of the flesh. Christ has made both of them one. Because it's not about the flesh anymore. Okay? He has made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition. The wall that separated us. He has broken that down. He's taken away the circumcision of the flesh. It's no longer required for um, being in as a separated people of God. Right? separated from the rest of the world, the holy people. So it's, it's uh, circumcised and uncircumcised are can be a part of those people, okay? Because having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the, the, the thing that was against us, Christ abolished that thing that was against us, not being circumcised. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So all these... Um, so there's a law of God that is the core of the law. And then Moses, when he, when he set up the nation of Israel, made all these other laws that are... Um, interpretations of the law and all these ordinances these are all these customs and ordinances to keep the law but they are not the law themselves right so God abolished in his flesh the en enemy of the flesh right the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make in himself out of two the circumcised and the uncircumcised, 
the Jews and the Christians to make out of the two one new man and making peace. Okay? Now I talked about this before and you'll find it in the Hebrew scriptures. I've talked about this a lot. Is the uh, joining the two sticks together into one. Uh, the, um, the, in the old prophecies in the Hebrew Bible. The, uh, the, the, the Messiah would come and join the kingdom of the northern and southern kingdom of Israel, Israel and Judah. He would join them together into one and make that a rod in his hand. So that's what Christ does. The circumcised and the uncircumcised. He makes them one. Okay? And you'll find now today, um, more than ever, there, there's a huge movement in the Jewish world of uh, Jews who are also Christians and it's, it's Jews who are seeing the, the prophecy is talking about Jesus Christ and, and they're seeing the merits of Jesus Christ because for a long time it was uh, there was a lot of information in the Jewish community misinformation about Jesus that had been put in there since ancient times and they're starting to see past that now and they're starting to see there is something to Jesus Christ there there's a lot to Jesus Christ when you compare him with the Hebrew scriptures because uh, you have no choice but to see it after all of this time you know so it's um it's a from it's a phenomena right now that um, among the Jews you'll see a lot of uh, messianic Jews because it, they, they're just starting to see all of this. It's been going on for a while now. But having their uh, Jewish background and then learning of Christ, it's even more powerful because that Jewish background has a lot of symbolism and a lot of knowledge of the Hebrew Scriptures attached to it. So that knowledge really gives you a good foundation for understanding all the things about the wisdom of Christ. So you're already set up for it in a lot of ways. So it's a good thing, right? Okay. So Christ has abolished that enmity between the, the circumcised and the uncircumcised by making both one new man. And he made peace. Okay. That makes a lot more sense in the ancient world in uh, the Middle East because there was that enmity. It was very apparent and Christ abolished that and th that's why Christianity broke out among the Gentiles, okay? That he might reconcile both unto God, both. He might reconcile both the circumcised and the uncircumcised to God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity the the, the separation between them the, the the thing that made set them apart he has broken that and brought them together right and they were enemies to each other uh, the Jews didn't want anything to do with the Gentiles or kept separate from them. And the Gentiles kept separate from the Jews. There was this wall. Okay. And he came and preached peace to you. So he's, Jesus, or Paul here is talking to Gentiles, right? The Ephesians, they were Gentiles who had believed Jesus. But he's saying, well, you know, we're going to learn Jewish things. So, you know, the Jews had always called you uncircumcised. They'd always called you not God's people. Now Paul's telling them, well, now you are God's people, right? And now you are reconciled to God. You are a part of this, okay? And... Jesus came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them which were near. So 
both the circumcised and the uncircumcised, since Christ came now, they both have to accept Christ to be a part of this one body, right? For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father, one Holy Spirit for both Jews and Gentiles. Okay? So this is, um, it's, it's saying there's still a difference. There's still a difference between Jews and Gentiles. But there's no wall between us. And we both have access to the same Spirit. We both have access to God. So this is interesting, you know. It's, um, it's not like a Jew has to become a Gentile. Or it's not like a Gentile has to become a Jew. But that wall between them has been broken. So that both are joined together. Like the prophecy in the Old Testament. The stick. Joining the stick. Let's take a quick look at that. Where are we? We're in Ephesians 2.18. Alright. Before we uh, look at this prophecy by Ezekiel. I want to give you a little bit of background. So we can have this in context. Now, about um, maybe 950 B.C., Solomon was the king of Israel. And when he sinned against God, God ended up splitting the kingdom in two. And it got split between the northern part, the kingdom of Israel, and the southern part, the kingdom of Judah. So the kingdom of Judah had Jerusalem as its capital. And they, most of the time, followed the, the God of Israel. Uh, but the northern kingdom of Israel, their, their capital was at Samaria. And they had golden calves and, and they mostly followed idols. And uh, so eventually... God um, kept warning them and they would never listen. So he um, ended up allowing the king of Assyria to come from the north. And he took the entire kingdom of Israel as slaves. And they were never seen again. And that is the uh, people today call that the lost ten tribes of Israel. They uh, completely disappeared off the map. And then the southern kingdom of Judah, 200 years later or so, 150 years later, 586 B.C., the kingdom of Babylon uh, came from the north and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And they took the, the people of Judah as slaves for 70 years. But God said that he won't completely take them away because of his promise to David. So he allowed them to come back after 70 years in order that his promise to David would be fulfilled. And that promise was that a son of David would sit on the throne of Israel forever. So, that's the background of the story of Israel. Now, we're going to take a look at some scriptures in this, in this context. Okay, now, the, this is the prophet Hosea, chapter 1. Now, Hosea, he prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel before they were taken away in 722 B.C. And this is a bit of a complicated uh, prophecy I uh, did a video on this prophecy. Um, uh, it's about an hour long. So I'll show you where that video is. But um, I'll just sort of briefly show you the scriptures that I'm talking about here. And here's Hosea chapter 1, verse 6. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. And God said to, God told the prophet to, to uh, take, take a wife 
Go take a wife of whoredoms, or an adulterous wife, and children of adultery, right? So, because the people and the nation were committing adultery against God with their idols. So, um, he says, and she conceived again and bore a daughter, and God said to him, call her name lo ru Emma." And which means uh, no mercy, no pity, right? For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. That's the northern kingdom. But I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, the southern kingdom. And I will save them by the Lord their God, and I will not save them by bow, nor by sword, but by battle, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. And then he says, when she had weaned lo ru -Hama, she conceived and bore a son. And then God said, call his name lo Ami. That's not my people. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. He's talking to the northern kingdom of Israel again. Call his, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my, pe my people, there it shall be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. And then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, one leader, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So it says here in verse 9, Call his name lo Ami, not my people. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea. So which cannot be measured or numbered. So he's saying to the northern kingdom of Israel, you are not my people and I will not be your God. And he said earlier, he will no longer have mercy on them. And then he says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea. So what he's saying is there's a different Israel saying you are no longer Israel is what he's saying to that northern kingdom of Israel. So he's bringing in a new Israel. So that is explained in uh, detail in the video that I will show you now. Okay, if you uh, go to my channel and hit like, and subscribe hint hint <laughs> now if you go on here click on my channel here it will take you to the page here and then you click on this playlist it will take you to the playlist and over here you'll see history of God view full playlist There's 59 videos in this playlist, and it's all uh, Bible stuff and history mostly. But the video I'm talking about is down here. There's a, there's a whole series here on Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, who are Ephraim and Manasseh? Ephraim and, and Manasseh are the two children that Joseph had when Joseph was in Egypt. So he had two children named Ephraim and Manasseh. And his father Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. And uh, said that they would be great. You can see here on this map right here. How big Manasseh was in Israel. And Ephraim was this part here. Now eventually this was during the time of the judges. Uh, before the kingdom of David, before Israel became a united kingdom. Um, now, 
when it was the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel became referred to as Ephraim. Because and, and Ephraim and Manasseh are referred to as the house of Joseph. So they're very important, those two tribes, because there's a lot of prophecy surrounding them. So I have a whole series here about how uh, the story of Joseph uh, sold into slavery, Joseph's dreams, Joseph obtains the birthright of Israel. And that's when Ephraim and Manasseh obtained the birthright. And then uh, it shows some history of Ephraim and Manasseh through the time of the judges and through Samuel and through David. And then uh, right here, Ephraim and Manasseh, the day of Jezreel. That's the prophecy in Hosea chapter 1. And you can see it's a, over an hour long. And that talks all about Hosea chapter 1. So if you want to review that video, then um, that'll tell you all about that, uh, how I came to that conclusion in Hosea chapter 1. Okay, now that uh, we've covered a little bit of that background, we're now going to look at Ezekiel chapter 37. So Ezekiel lived at about uh, maybe 590 BC or so, 595. He, uh, he uh, was prophesying in uh, about a decade before the destruction of Jerusalem. So the northern kingdom of Israel had already been taken away over a hundred years earlier. And there was only the southern kingdom of Judah left. And they were going to be taken away within another 10 years. And Ezekiel, uh, the king of Babylon came and he didn't destroy Jerusalem, but he did take some slaves away from Jerusalem. And Ezekiel was among those slaves. So now Ezekiel was given this prophecy that we're going to look at. And it's in Ezekiel chapter 37, starting in, in verse 15. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Moreover, you son of man, take a stick and write on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Okay, so he has two sticks. One for Judah and for the children of Israel. And the second stick is for the house of Joseph and Ephraim. So remember, Ephraim is one of the two sons of Joseph. And for the house of Israel. So there's the two kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdom. That's what this two pieces of stick represent. And then, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in your hand. So it, it was a miracle that the two sticks actually became one stick in, in Ezekiel's hand. And when the children of your people shall speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. So what that's sort of alluding to is that the northern and southern kingdom will be reunited into one kingdom. And the sticks whereon you write shall be in your hand before their eyes. And say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, 
This is a King James Version. It's from among the Gentiles. Where they are gone, the lost ten tribes, right? And I will gather them on every side. So he's gathering not only them, but all the Gentiles. And I will bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be a king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. So um, this is a Hebrew um, way of speaking, is that the idols and the detestable things and the transgressions are all talking about the same thing. The idols are detestable things, and the idols are, are transgressions. It's all the same thing, right? So, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. So that's, that's um, actually quoting Hosea chapter 1, right? And David, my servant, shall be king over them. That's Jesus. Jesus is the son of David, right? And they shall all serve one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be a prince, their prince, forever. Moreover, so the, the, his servant David, that is Jesus. Okay? Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the Gentiles shall know that I the Lord do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. So that's the prophecy of Ezekiel I was pointing out. Now, if we take a look at Ephesians again, chapter 2, scroll down where we were talking here, okay? Um, so he's, he was talking about uh, the Gentiles being, being strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Right? But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off are made near by the blood of Christ, and He is our peace. So here's the covenant of peace, and He had made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So this is the joining of the two sticks, right? So right here in verse uh, 15, He made in Himself of two one new man, making peace, that He might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy. And he came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them which were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now you are no more strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. So you see, that's the stick prophecy of Ezekiel. 
taking place that Paul is talking about here. All right, so now we'll carry on and we'll finish off the second chapter of Ephesians. So we finished looking at the Ezekiel prophecy. He came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them which were near. And now we'll continue. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of a God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So there, in the, you'll find in the, that playlist, History of God, there's also a, a whole video about the, the cornerstone. Uh, what a cornerstone is, is in ancient times, even now it works the same way, but in ancient times it was even more important that the very first stone laid for a building was extremely important because every angle after that stone would be measured off of that stone. So that stone had to be perfectly level and it had to be pointing in the exact right direction because that stone would determine where the walls are going to go because every the next stone would be lined up with that one and all the other stones would be lined up from that stone. So that's the chief corner stone. And we know the apostles uh, often spoke of uh, we are a spiritual house as living stones built upon the foundation of Christ himself being the cornerstone and that is the church of God where wherein the Holy Spirit dwells, right? So and and you also notice built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So that Jesus Christ is the most important thing for lining up your, your faith. And the apostles and the prophets are also the foundation. So any church or any teacher that does not have the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ, the words in the Bible as a foundation is preaching some other thing okay so that's that's extremely important and not only certain verses out of the Bible or little one-liners out of context it's got to fit the whole context of the Bible there's a story being told there are principles being laid out and it all fits together Okay, so now, so Jesus is the chief cornerstone in whom all the building, fitly framed together, grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. This is the, the temple of God, the sanctuary he was talking about. In whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit is in you and he inhabits you as he inhabits every child of God and every believer and that is the temple of God okay thank you very much and we'll see you next week don't forget to like share and subscribe and see you later